Huh? Yes, Erica. No, I did not. Um, well, we might as well get going and then maybe we can go home early. Because unless you guys got a lot of questions, I can probably cover the whole Bible in about five minutes. <laughs> I mean, my version, New American Kenny version, right? Um, I, I'm hoping that Josh is hearing me and we're starting the live stream. Um, but I wanted to take it just a minute. And I know this is probably an overstatement of the obvious. I'm not Josh, okay? <laughs> Josh's birthday is today, so I got a call last night, and he said, would you fill in? And I said, no, uh, because the camera had 10 pounds. And so then Jill said, no, it takes 10 off. So I said, okay, then I'm in. So um, no, I just wanted to get an opportunity to, to come in, give him a night off. And uh, so a few um, uh, disclaimers. Want to welcome everybody that is online. Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. Sorry I'm not, Josh. Uh, but I, I guess I'm really not sorry I'm not, Josh. <laughs> um, but a few ground rules. Uh, no random questions from the Bible, okay, Tom? I mean you. Nothing. Um, and if you think you're tricking me, I already have. For those of you who didn't notice, I have. I don't know, okay? So that's what we're going to. If I don't know, that's where we're going. But uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, how many of you, just, this is just for my information, how many of you have been here for less than two years at the church? That is crazy. Uh, not, no, not you're crazy. It's just, it's crazy. Um, so <clears throat> I'll tell you who I am, not that it's important. Uh, my name's Kenny. Uh, last name's Havas. My lovely bride, Carrie, is sitting right there. Uh, in support of uh, me bumbling through tonight. And um, I was on staff here for, uh, I believe, almost four years, you know, directing the prison ministry when we were still able to go to prisons, because uh, we can't do that right now. But uh, we've been going here since this was actually the point, 11 years? 11 years. So apologize for not having been here much. Um, we've been visiting a lot of our churches that support us at the jail ministry. I am now the chaplain at the Genesee County Jail. So it provides a lot of opportunity and uh, um, something I never thought that I'd be doing, but um, I guess God had other plans. So who's to say God doesn't have a sense of humor? Um, I mean, look where I'm at. So I just wanted to uh, start out tonight. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll get into it, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come share with our uh, church family with what you're doing at the jails. Father, just help us to be attentive tonight to the Holy Spirit. Help us to be ready to listen uh, to what he has to say to us, Lord, and I'd ask that uh, you get me out of the way, and uh, please, Lord, just uh, have me say the things that you would have me to say. We want to give this whole night to you for your honor and your glory, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so some of you, I know this is going to be repeat information because uh, a few of you have been in the growth community with Carrie and I, so sorry, Christina, you know. Sorry, but uh, just to let you know a little bit, I want to share a little bit of my testimony and how I got to where I'm standing today. Um, I grew up in a uh, very fundamental Baptist church um, and um, grew up in a family that did a lot of singing. Genevieve, I know what that's like. Not that I'm any good, but I know what that's like. Um, but we uh, went to a church locally. And at around 18, I had surrendered uh, my life over to Christ and um, started working with youth. And I have a passion for youth, and I worked with youth for probably on and off for over 30, 35 years. And it's come full circle now. It's very helpful, believe it or not, in the jail ministry. And uh, it's kind of scary, but it's true. Um, but um, also, while I was at that church, I... 
Uh, I traveled with a singing group. That was fun, different. Um, I led worship. I, pretty much if the church doors were open, I was there. Uh, but uh, much like Josh, I, I let um, the things that God had given me or entrusted me with, which were gifts, I let that go to my head. And God humbled me and humbled me hard. And so I went through a couple years of being resentful, being angry with God, not doing anything horrible, but didn't go to church, and just kind of indifferent, right? And then uh, God finally got a hold of me a couple years later after I went through a divorce, and um, and said, Kenny, it was not about what you were doing for me, because I thought, well, why would I go through a divorce if I was doing all this for you, God? But really, the divorce was a product of my own choices, right? And uh, so after two years of being angry, um, I met a lovely lady that's sitting on my right here. Um, and uh, I grew a spiritual brain that said, uh, okay, God, it's about what you did for me. And from that point forward, we started, I think, going after we got married, we started going uh, to a church that I had been at before. And um, Carrie comes from a, is it okay to share this? Okay. Uh, Carrie comes from a Jehovah's Witness background. Not anymore, okay? But she comes from a Jehovah's Witness background. So that gave me uh, a lot of opportunities to really share with her my faith. And um, so one of my greatest joys in the... 17 years that we've been married. Um, that's right. Okay. I mean, you had a blank look on your face, so <laughs> either I was right and you didn't know or vice versa. Um, but one of my greatest joys has been watching her faith grow and God become more and more real to her and the way that she loves people is amazing. So that's been amazing. And in that whole process over the 17 years, God's walked me through some interesting situations. We started coming here um, when Josh's dad was still speaking here. And uh, so both Carrie and her two sons accepted Christ. Uh, they got baptized. And I said, let's, hey, let's get, start serving somewhere, right? So my go-to was a youth ministry. Um, but we didn't feel that that was something we were led to do together right away. So I said, well, how about security? So I started serving on security, right? Um, served on security for a number of years. Then we started working with the youth. And um, in 2015, I had an opportunity to go to the Philippines. And it was with Josh and his mom and uh, like four other guys, a couple from the Grand Blank location. And at that time, we had the Flint location. And... Um, so we went to the Philippines for two weeks, and it changed my life. It did. Just uh, to see, you know, here are folks in a third world country bringing you food that they don't have to share. They're going to go hungry to feed the American missionaries coming over there. Um, it was humbling. And what, a, what I thought was a really cool picture of what the church is, right? We came back after two weeks, and the next year... Um, I started volunteering with the prison ministry because I, I told Carrie, I said, one of the uh, things we did as a singing group was we sang at the Genesee County Jail. I said, well, captive audience, why not? They can't run away, you know. <laughs> in theory, they could not come in, but, um, <laughs> um, but um, I had really enjoyed it. And I said, well, we had started doing the prison trips. And uh, are, are, has anybody in here been on a prison trip that we've done? Troy, I know you have. Dean has been. Anybody else? Wow. This is cool. Okay, um, so the prison trips, we started out doing one prison in Ohio, and then it very quickly, over like a seven-year period, escalated to every prison in Ohio, with the exception of the, uh, the, most, uh, the most violent, the level four and up prisons. And what we would do is we would... how. We, God gave us favor to do this. It's crazy. But what I'm about to tell you is all true. We rode motorcycles into the prison through the Sally Port, which is the entry where they bring in like the semi-loads of food and everything for the jail. 
we would ride in like 20 motorcycles. We'd take a van full of musicians and instrumentation, a trailer full of staging. And we'd go in and we would, I know, wait, okay. Anybody go to a fundamental Baptist church before they came here? Okay, okay, cover your ears, okay? <laughs> we sang secular music, okay, sorry, you know. But, you know, we did, we sang uh, classic, classic rock. Um, but, you know, it was really, if we sang Christian music, the guys probably wouldn't come around. They wouldn't know the music. Well, it's uh, nice, nice, but they wouldn't have come around. And then we also had a guy that came with us that his, uh, the, his little, has anybody ever seen Rodney in here? A few people, okay. So Rodney's this uh, amazing guy, good friend of mine. His name's Rich. He does this character called Rodney, and he calls himself a comedian magician. When his magic works, he's a magician. When he doesn't, he becomes a comedian. And so uh, he has an innate ability to draw people in. He's very, very good at what he does, and he dresses up, and he's just goofy, and he's funny, and it's not an environment where a lot of people do any laughing, but he's very good at drawing them in. They come in, they're laughing. What's everybody laughing about? So it just draws a crowd, and we may end up with around 1,000 to 1,500 guys or women around us in a prison, but all of this was designed to get as many people around us as possible so we could do one thing, and that's share the gospel, because that's the only thing that changes anybody's life, right? That's what changed mine. The only difference was him, right? Um, so we'd go in, and then uh, one of the pastors would share the gospel, and then they would turn it over to us as the team. We'd take in around 30 or 40 people in, inside a prison. We're out on the yard where they recreate and everything. We're not inside a building. It's all open air. And uh, then they turn us loose to go pray with the inmates, hand out a book that we'd written for them, and we use the book as a ticket to shake their hand and say, hey, here's a book. If you want it, take it. If you don't, don't. Is there something I can pray with you about? And then ask him, you know, hey, what about the message or something? You want to show us how you can throw your life to God? You want to, I mean, whatever the little tagline was in the message that the pastor had spoke. So we did that for, I did that for, um, I think, five years. And I was going, I told Carrie at one point, I said, I, I think I want to go on every one of these trips. And, and she said, well, okay, because you come back a better dude. So, um, okay. So I had a lot of, I was working at Oxford Township Parks and Recreation at the time. And um, so I had ample vacation time working for the government, you know. Um, so I went on a lot of those trips. And um, I think it was in 2017, uh, Josh came up and he called me one day and he says, hey, I want you to uh, do me a favor. And I said, what's that? And he said, I'd like you to pray about the prison ministry in the direction it's going. Oh, okay, cool. You know, I've been on a number of trips. And I think, yeah, okay, I'll pray about it. That was on Wednesday. And he called me back on Friday, and he goes, I don't know if I was specific enough. I want to ask you to prayerfully consider taking over the prison ministry and directing it. Well, they hadn't had anybody directing all the aspects of the prison ministry. But as he started reading off all of the things that they were looking for someone to have skill sets with, experience with music, mechanical, I owned my own lawn and landscape business, trailers, trucks, blah, blah, all this. I'm going, check, 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 check. Okay, well, we'll pray about it. He came home and, and I told Carrie, and she, <laughs> she's sitting there and go, well, what's that look like financially? I'm going, I don't know. It doesn't matter if we're supposed to do it, right? So uh, we took it on and, and we did the prison ministry here for... I think a little over three years. And we ended up going to, by the time I left, I think we were doing somewhere between 40 and 50 facilities a year that we were going into and doing this. Either what, what I described to you as, and we called that the full program, or then we started doing sports as well. So we'd go in with a softball team or a basketball team, depending on the season, with the men. And the ladies, we would go in uh, in the wintertime and we would have, take a volleyball team. And it's really important that you're competitive when you go in and play sports in, in jails or prisons because if you're not, you don't really gain their respect. So we had some college-level basketball players. We had some really good softball players. We had some ladies that played volleyball. A couple of the ladies on our team, two or three, played college volleyball. So we had competitive teams, and we had a chance to do all that. Um, but here at the end of 2019, uh, 
the Forgotten Man Ministries called, who was a supporting, uh, we, who we supported at the Genesee County Jail, and they asked, said, hey, we've been out without a chaplain for a couple of years. Would you help us with the interview process, interview some candidates? And I said, yeah, I guess, not a problem. And so I did. And uh, the first couple guys they interviewed that it really, they didn't have experience or anything. And I felt like this was going a direction that I didn't really want it to go because I loved what I was doing with the prison ministry, right? And so I didn't think God would ever take me from that. But <clears throat> the executive director for Forgot Man uh, said to me, he said, Kenny, we called me on my birthday in 2019. He says, uh, I'd like you to prayerfully consider taking on the chaplaincy at Genesee County Jail. And I laughed at him. And I said, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. And I told him, I said, I mean, if you guys hear chaplain, what do you think about? Don't be, you know what? Don't be afraid to answer, okay? You don't need the microphone. When you hear chaplain, what do you think about? Black and white collar, okay? Anybody else? What do you think about? Okay. I'm not a pastor, but that's great. <laughs> I get called that all the time. I say, no, I don't want that responsibility. Um, I think of Father Mulcahy off MASH. I mean, maybe that dates me. But that's what I think of, you know. It's like, I'm not qualified. And then I told him I'm too old. And he goes, I don't think either one of those things are true. So I said, okay, well, we'll pray about it. And I, and I um, went home and I told Carrie about it. And, and I started praying about it. But have you guys ever prayed about something, but really your like, heart wasn't in it? And I'll pray because, you know, I said I would pray. And, but you're really not, your heart's not in it. Well, that's what I did for the better part of a month. And I was going through a thing they called discovering discernment, where you go and take a look at the ministry, go to other county jails and stuff. So Forgot Man Ministries is a 55-year-old ministry that has been, is only in Michigan, and it's only in county jails. There's no prisons. It is the largest jail-only ministry in the whole country. So... Genesee County is their second largest jail in all of the 35. And I'm thinking, and you want me to take that? Don't you have some part-time gig somewhere that's like out on the farm? I mean, I look more like a farmer. Uh, but um, they, we were going through the discovering discernment period. And so we were going to a couple other county jails. I think we were out in Kent County and Ottawa County. That's probably their two, two of their bigger uh, well-run jails. And um, I got a chance to speak in front of what they call their grow pod, which is GRO, God Restoring Offenders. <laughs> and it's a very concentrated, multi-hour, intense Bible study that these guys or ladies subject themselves to, to voluntarily be a part of, that allows them certain privileges. Like they can be housed together, but they have to... I mean, is it okay if I just be honest? Okay, they really have to watch their personal hygiene. That's a thing in jail. I don't know if you know that or not. Um, there's usually a smell that goes with prisons or jails. Um, sorry to be so crass, but it's true. Um, so personal hygiene, they can't miss classes. They can't miss do those things. All of it's designed with, to try to restore giving themselves some self-respect. Many of these folks grew up in situations where they didn't have a parent involved. So if you imagine your kids raising themselves, what would that look like? I went to a Michigan uh, State facility here in Lapeer, uh, you guys, Thumb Correctional, I don't know if many of you know it, and I went over there, and th that's also a facility for the um, under 17 and under felony inmates in the state of Michigan. And the chaplain told me that the worst thing in that, those four, those four buildings that house those, those young guys was the smell. And they would tell them, you know, hey, you got you to gotta take a shower. And the, the answer would be is why? I mean, I mean, our kids said that when they were like three or four, not when they were 18 or 19, right? But that's how these kids are abandoned a lot. Of, and, and, and it ends up going into adulthood. So that's the type of environment that we work in. And so I got a chance to be in front of the grow pod. And I didn't know that I was supposed to speak in front of the crow pod, which is like 35 or 40 guys in the, inside the jail at Kent County. 
And so I just got up and, you know, then it's like, da, 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 da. you know, you just <laughs> make stuff up. No, you, I mean, I got up and I started talking and I, to be honest with you, I don't remember what I said. I don't. So he said, either it's early stages of dementia or the Holy Spirit was speaking through me. I'm going to go with the latter because I'm just in denial about dementia. Um, but Carrie, we got out of there and I didn't really, literally didn't remember what I said. And we got out and we started walking towards the car and Carrie said to me, she said, what'd you say? What are you waiting for? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, babe, that's your wheelhouse. And I'm going... So it was okay, <laughs> you know? She said, yeah, it was. So uh, that's when I actually decided to actually start praying actively and sincerely, Lord, if this is what you want, you need to show me because I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box, okay? Just make it plain. And then I went back. So Josh will probably get mad that I should do that. But I did a, something really weird. I told the executive director, I said, hey, would you meet with our pastor? He's going the one you work for right now? I said, yeah. Like the three of us, can we meet? <laughs> he goes, never done that before, but okay. So imagine going into a meeting where you have the guy you're working for who doesn't necessarily, I don't think he wanted me to leave, um, but you're, work, you're working for this guy and this guy's wanting you to work for him and you're like in a, a meeting. And it was a really cool, it was a really cool meeting. Um, Josh said something that's, um, I, after I, I responded to him, I said, I don't know if I'm called to do this he, or if I'm capable of doing this. And he goes, Josh said, God doesn't call the capable or he doesn't call, he doesn't enable, he doesn't call those that are qualified. He qualifies those that are called. Does that make sense? Steve? Yeah? Okay. So in other words, he calls you because he can be seen through you because you aren't capable. And so I thought, okay. And he told, uh, he told Nate, uh, the executive director of Forgot Man, that, they, that the river would pay me for the full month I was going through Discovery and Sermon, even though I wasn't going to be there. So that was, that was very God-honoring, I thought. And I, um, so we accepted the call. We started at uh, Forgot Man Ministries at the Genesee County Jail, January 6th, the same day as Sheriff Swanson, who I don't know many of you may know Sheriff Swanson or know of him. He's kind of a he's kind of a live wire that one, uh, but uh, tremendous man of God, uh, and uh, so I have a chance to work with him, and it's been amazing. I would tell you that uh, I have the opportunity to say things to people like, you know, I'm standing up at a bean to go where where M works, and and I'll say, oh, heading off to jail, and people start looking. <laughs> You know, just do it for effect. And, but a lot of times it gives us a chance to witness to them at the coffee shop. So I, I always say that Carrie complains that I go up to the coffee shop and hang out for an hour. I said, hey, it's ministry. It's part of my job. But uh, it is cool. We do have a lot of opportunities. Um, but I get opportunities to go share about what we do with groups like this. And it's important. It's important work. It's important work because these are people that are forgotten literally, by not only just the standards of society, but many times in their own mind, they feel like God's forgotten them or is to a point where he can't forgive them. I mean, I don't know if I've felt many times, especially in that two-year period, it's like I've screwed up so bad, God doesn't want anything to do with me. You know, so many people get to feel like that, especially if they're sitting in a jail having done something maybe possibly horrific, okay? Um, so it's it's an opportunity to go speak with people who may or may not be at the lowest point of their life. And so um, it, takes a, it takes compassionate people. It takes people who are genu genuine and don't have an agenda. We work with multiple denominations and it drives me crazy. Uh, it just does. I apologize. But I don't. It, it, it's, it makes me crazy just because everybody wants to say they're, you know, they want to bring their little things into, and many of it's the Protestants. <laughs> just, it's what it is, you know. Um, everybody's got their distinctives. I don't like that word. Uh, I had one of the chaplains when we were going through Discovering Discernment. 
uh, share with me. He said, the chaplaincy is like ice cream. <laughs> okay, you weren't there when they said this. Uh, it's like ice cream. Uh, most Christians think there's 31 flavors, like Baskin-Robbins. But at the chaplaincy, we sell vanilla ice cream. We sell the gospel. The gospel is what changes people's lives. That's what we focus on. But what we have to convince churches and folks to be willing to do is we can do everything inside the jail, sharing the gospel, having, seeing guys and women have their lives changed, start surrendering or go through these grow pods, do all these things. And the, the chaplaincy used to be really good at doing one other thing. I call it spiritually powdering the backside of these inmates going back into to society. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some statistics here. This is probably going to blow your mind. It did me anyway. Uh, Genesee County Jail. Um, 15,000 people a year go through that facility between men and women. 15,000 a year. Um, the statistic is 80% of them don't go on to prison. 80% either go on parole or especially nowadays with COVID and stuff, many of them are coming back into their homes to go out on personal recognizance bonds, they go out on tether, they go on those things because the courts aren't processing through very quickly. Um, and so <clears throat> we, we have a lot of people that are going back into the communities. So if these are all, if many of them are baby Christians coming back into the society, into the communities, and we just pat them on the back and said, go find a Bible-believing church, how much success do you think that they're going to have spiritually? Uh, I'm going to tell you right now that it's not very high. It's not very high. I've actually had churches that I would go in and talk to um, that the pastors or their uh, assistant pastors or someone at the church would say, we don't want to minister to those people. That's a bold statement. Um, I t I, my first thing is right away I want to get indignant and say, well, you might as well cut Matthew 25 out of the Bible where it says, you know, when I was naked, you gave me clothes, and thirsty, you gave me something to drink, hungry, you fed me, and when I was sick, you visited me, and when I was in prison, you did what? You visited me, right? That's important. Um, so we have to, as the body of Christ, and it doesn't matter the church or the denomination, we as the body of Christ have to be ready to bring these people alongside. If we don't, then the work that we're doing inside the jail, I always say this, it's like we might as well be teaching them about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny because they're going to think it's just as real as those two. Does anybody believe in Santa Claus? Sorry. Thank you. Hope that didn't go on online. <laughs> um, but there is, it's a unique place to work. It's a unique place to work. Um, and I would rather, instead of getting up and speaking from a pulpit, because I don't know if you can probably tell I'm not a gifted speaker, but what I would rather do is I would rather do what we're doing now in a, in a I guess, la lack of a better term, in a more intimate setting where you guys can ask questions. Because it's, most people have these stereotypes of what it's like and what it's not like and, you know, what's ministry look like inside the jail and what, you know, I mean, all those things. So I'm going to give you a couple more statistics, but think about a couple questions of something that you may have as you think of what does it look like to do ministry inside the jail or situations that arise. Or think about a couple of those things, but I'm going to give you a couple other statistics. There's no, <clears throat> if you get the answer wrong in this, don't worry about it. Um, if you've seen any of those um, correction shows, I mean, like a, you know, prison behind bars or any of these other shows, a lot of these supposed reality shows that people watch in regards to jail or prison life, what do what would be your take a guess at what you think the ethnic mix of the population of the jails are or prison? Like, let's just go with Genesee County. Black. Pardon me. Predominantly black. Predominantly black. Okay. So more than 50%? 60%? Okay. Anybody else? What do you think? I'm, I'm not going to chastise you if you're wrong. Don't worry. I mean, the common misconception, I think, is that it's 
the way it's displayed on TV, I, a lot of times I see it's like 80% black, 20% white. Now, this varies from county to county. In Genesee County, the population in the city of Flint is 60% black, 40% white. Okay? Most of the city churches think that that's a much higher percentage, black to white, but it's not true. The population at the Genesee County Jail, traditionally, without exception, within a percentage point either way, is 50-50. So it's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. That's what we have to focus on, and that's what I think is an interesting dynamic, is that there's no, right now, there are no city, what I would call city churches, churches within the city limits of Flint, other than maybe a couple, that support our ministry at all. But there are many people that are from the city of Flint that are going back to there. So are they, where's the disconnect? Where's the disconnect? So what we have as an opportunity with the chaplaincy is to change the idea that it's not a black and white issue, right? I've tried to get my my buddy, one of my assistants, is a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, He's a pretty cool guy. He's a really cool first name. His name's Ken. And uh, he is, um, he's a black guy. And one of the things that um, in July of last year, uh, Forgot Man asked me to take on being over the eastern region of Forgot Man. So now I've been a chaplain for seven months or six, six or seven months at that point, and they asked me to take over the region. So be over chaplains who have been chaplains for 26 years. That's going to go well, you know. Uh, but it really has. It has gone well. Um, but in order to do that, both those positions are 40-hour-a-week jobs. And um, Carrie would not be happy if, if I was working 80 hours a week. Um, but... Uh, they allowed me to hire somebody to take uh, some of my hours in the jail. So I was able to do the region. So I hired Ken, and Ken is amazing. Uh, We've become very, very close very quickly. And uh, he was also the lead pastor at the uh, Hill Road Baptist Church in Grand Blanc. So, but he's he's an interesting, he's an interesting guy. And he's helping me um, reach into a lot of the city churches because he knows a lot. He's been in the city of Flint for years and years and years, and uh, it's fun to watch um, pastors, whether it's a white, predominantly white church or predominantly black church, the two of us come in together because we genuinely love each other, and we break a stereotype that's exciting to me. So, But those are really just some of the basics of what we do. So I thought I'd end... We, how much time do we have? Oh, wow. We're going to be here a while. Um, I told you. Uh, but anyway, are there any questions? Nothing other than normal questions if you ask Josh. Those are off limits. But do you guys have any questions on how the, the jail ministries ran? Mike. So did you say there's like 15,000 a year that come through the jail? 15,000, yeah. How many of those are placed back out in the society and are successful at acquiring a job again and getting their life back together? Okay, so the question, I should have handed you the mic. I apologize, it's somewhere. I don't know where it's at. Um, oh, it's right there. Um, so the question Mike asked, asked was, how many of the 15,000 get released is, are affected by our ministry and then are successful in finding a job and maybe connecting a church and have some success? Um, so that's a really hard question to ask um, 100% accurately. The way I would answer is this, is that 80% of the, the 15,000 to go through, go back into the community, like I said. Of that 80%, whatever percentage of those folks were able to get through what we call our grow pod, um, I think the statistic is, is only 25% of them come back within three years. Now, there's a term within the corrections industry, it's called recidivism. And so it's a very catchy buzzword that, that most corrections officers will use and, and uh, correction professionals will use. And the recidivism is the rate at which inmates, once they get out, how much, what that percentage is coming back into the system within three years. So in the state of Michigan, 
that number is about 70% come back within three years. Seven out of 10 come back. So that tells me there's just something broken, right? Uh, either, either the job's not getting done at the jail or the prison level. Um, and I can tell you that probably both are guilty. Um, I've met some chaplains at prisons across four different states that are not engaged. It's an administration position. And they, they, it's better than being a corrections officer. So they're not there because they're called. They're there for literally a job. And it reflects in how they bring programs and, and stuff in many times. So that's not always the case. But um, I would tell you in the years that I was in the prison ministry that fewer times it was the chaplain that brought us in. It's more times not. It was, the, it was the rec director who had the relationship with Christ that brought us in. So, or a staff member, an assistant warden, or the warden, or whatever. It, it differed all the time, all the time. So it was just always amazing the different people that God would use to, to gain us access into our respective prison. We'd start praying about a prison that we weren't in, and all of a sudden, well, this person knows somebody over there, so we just start connecting the dots, you know what I mean? But <clears throat> it's, it's funny, and it's funny, more ironic, I guess, that from state to state, the difference in the recidivism rate. So Michigan is traditionally what they call a lock and feed state, which really means that they'll offer, pro the state of Michigan offers programs, but they're not always incentivized to do any of these programs or complete these programs. It's really left up to the inmates and their desire to or not do it. Um, whereas in Ohio, it's very program driven. Um, and they're incentivized, and it shows with the recidivism rate down there. The recidivism, recidivism rate in Ohio is about 30%. So that's a stark contrast. So um, it's, it's exciting to see those type of things done, um, but um, it's not always, it's not always uh, the best results. Not always best results, but you know, it's just depends on who's in leadership at the time. You know, um, different governors, different appoint different corrections uh, administrators, and so like for the state levels. So it varies from administration to administration. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, you could have said no too, but <laughs> that was my answer. Oh, uh, follow up. Follow up. Circling back. So, Sorry. That was horrible. Sorry. Okay. How many churches are you uh, having now that are getting involved in helping these inmates like to try to get back into the society? I know that I just came to South Carolina talking with John Carter, and it's a really huge problem down there. Mm -hmm. People are getting out of prison and trying to relocate them back into society. And a lot of the churches down there are like really, really like, yeah, no, we don't, we don't help these kind of people. Those kind of people. Yeah, that's... Uh, without, I, I'll just give you a real answer. It's going to sound negative. It's not meant to be. Okay. Um, so in Genesee County, we'll just use the county that I know of, but it's not too dissimilar across the 35 counties that we have uh, chaplaincies in. Um, there are probably over 700 churches in Genesee County. I mean, I don't know if you guys realize that. That floored me when I heard it. 700 churches. Um, and it seems like the smaller the church, the more titles for the leaders, you know, apostle, pastor, deacon, church. I mean, it's, it's, I, don't know, it's, I think it's funny, but anyway. Um, of those 700 right now, there are only 18 that support us in any way with a dollar or more a year. And I don't, say, I don't even think it's the church's fault. I think it was the chaplaincy's fault. There, you know, people... It's not just the chaplain. It was just people are people. And, um, you know, there are churches that will send hundreds, if not thousands of dollars across the world. 
but we miss an opportunity to reach those that we may be living next to tomorrow. And if we want to make our communities better, if we want to make... How, how, many, how many churches would grow if, you, if you've got an inmate coming out of the Genesee County uh, Jail who's been through a grow pod, who's been through discipling, who's been through probably more than... A, more concentrated training than probably I've been through other than personal study, but actually kind of a curriculum to work through like you would in a college class or something like that. How many churches would benefit from having somebody lead a growth community? In our instance here, somebody that could lead a growth community like that for people who are, let's just call them down and outers or whatever, people who've got struggles. I mean, there's, we've got people in our church that have gone through some struggles. Let's just be honest. Somebody who can talk with them who has ex like experiences but had success by surrendering control of their life over to God, letting God lead their life, not let you know, their choices be the ones that are influenced by their own decisions. That could be a pretty powerful thing. So am I discouraged about the number of churches? No, I'm encouraged that we have a lot of work to do. So, um, but I can't do it myself. You know, I mean, it's like, okay, God, you got to do this. So I started out with, I'm not capable for this, right? I mean, I'm not qualified. I, at our banquet last year, I, I, I shared a statement that I frequently use. I'm a lawn jockey from nowhere. Um, I had a lawn landscape business for 22 years from Goodrich. And I know if you live in Goodrich, sorry, but I still think it's kind of nowhere. Uh, I like it that way, though. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, but seriously, I mean, I, I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not trying to be super humble. I'm, I'm just not. Um, the only thing I believe that I'm gifted at is wanting to see God as real. How many of you have ever experienced an instance in your life where God was so real that it's like, okay, there's no way that could be coincidence? right? Have you guys experienced that? If you haven't, it's like, okay, I'm telling you right now, where you see God is real, where he makes himself most evident is when you don't believe you can do something, but you feel called to do it, right? So I would always tell everybody with the prison ministry, it's like, if you feel God calling you or tugging at you to come do the prison ministry with us, come one time. Come one time. And you'll know as soon as that door closes behind you, right away it's like, yeah, this is not for me. Or, this is cool. You know, and so I was the latter, and I, I just dig it. I do. I love it. Yes, ma'am. Um, Hang on. Yeah. Doing my job. Says, my my ahead. people perish for lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the, my stick, according to my Research it says there's 2,500 churches in Genesee County, and I've been to a number of churches because I'm in ministry. And the question I would pose to you, I think there's a lot of people that would open up their heart to someone that's been in prison. But um, do you think there could be some type of program um, where you'd send a letter out to all 2,500, 2,000 churches, whatever, and invite people saying we're going to have this program? At such and such a place, if you'd like to learn how your church can be a recipient of someone co coming out of jail and learn how you can <coughs> disciple them, how you, you know, just even if you just took one person and they were invited to come to your church and learn how to um, help them, to love them, I think that's the biggest problem is, is lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's because of lack of desire. There's plenty of people. I've, I've been across this, like 80 different churches, mm -hmm. and people want to help out, but basically, I mean, I'm hearing you for the first time tonight. I've heard of forgotten my ministries and so forth, but pastors don't know how. And I would encourage you to offer seminars and invite pastors to say, if you'd like to have a prison person come to your church and help them grow in the Lord, that they've they, they've, they've grown inside the church, and they now they need help outside the church. Mm -hmm. One person that you're willing to, to 
to love and, and, and nurture. There's, um, I know if, if someone came to the church I'm attending, um, I don't, the pastor's new there, doesn't know. Uh, hmm. People in the church don't know. So the pastor, you teach the pastor, the pe pastor comes back to the church and teaches his people. Because uh, people go to, to um, jail for a variety of reasons. It can be for domestic reasons. It can be for um, child molestation, mm -hmm. murder, robbery. I mean, you name it. So how, when these people come out, you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable, but you want to make them feel loved. You, know, you want the interaction to be positive. Right. And I think that's what people need to learn how. I don't know how, personally. Mm -hmm. I've interacted with a lot of people. I love people. At the same time, I used to teach um, at Goodwill prisoners that came out from all different spectrums. And I did, I, I did their resumes. I taught classes. I taught them how to get ready for an interview and that type of thing. But as far as church life, I would say it's, it's lack of knowledge. And I would challenge you. Think about that. How can you have a program and offer it to... 200 pastors to come and learn. Take that many at a time, and then they can take that knowledge back to their churches and then have a program of people coming out of jail and say, hey, you can go to this church. They'd love to have you come. And they know they're going to be treated right. They're not going to be treated like an oddball. Or, uh, you know, I've vi I have visited churches where I basically, I walk, walked in and I walked out and no one said hi. I've gone into another church, um, I felt like I, I, you know, that was my, my second family. They hugged me so much. Um, so we, we live in different times, mm -hmm. but it still is not an excuse. My Bible says to gather, period. And right. I admire this church for doing what it does and um, not being stupid in these times uh, and obeying God and not obeying man. So that's all I have to say, right or wrong. You don't have to agree with me. I just no, I do, agree, I do agree with you. So thank you for asking the question. And... And so, yes, I mean, there's things that we do that are public where we try to get as many pastors and, and we, we put on mailing lists and try to invite folks, whether it's a banquet, whether it's a statewide live event, whether it's many different things that we do. And um, is it necessarily the best? Well, like you mentioned right now, there's a lot of churches that aren't meeting at all. So just to kind of give you an idea, Right now, Carrie and I have been going around visiting a lot of the churches that support us first. We want to try to kind of solidify that base, you know, make sure that we know they know that we appreciate them, that we appreciate them being ready to assimilate these folks back into the body of Christ or the first time maybe into the body of Christ and how to do that and what's available at the jail to do. Uh, if you want to volunteer in the jail, there's things to do that you can volunteer outside of the jail. There's many of those things, and we're trying to educate people as quickly and as efficiently as we can. But many of the, um, it's not just the city churches, but predominantly the city churches right now are not meeting at all, right? They're not gathering at all. And, and that's, that's a safety concern for them. I'm not judging them for that, but it makes it difficult to, to go in and speak to any group of people. I mean, I could speak to the pastor, and the pastor could cover things on Zoom, people, Zoom calls, but I don't know, how many's been, who, who's been on a Zoom call? Everybody? <laughs> I'm sick and tired of Zoom calls, right? Um, but I don't know about you, but it's like if I turn, if I'm on a Zoom call and I want to do something like scratch or whatever, I can just click that little magic button that turns the camera off and I can do, 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 do. I'm not listening, you know, and I'm thinking some people do that with church. And I'm looking to see if anybody feels guilty, but. picking on Dina. So I, but I, I, I hear what you're saying, and that, that is encouraging. I, I, I agree with you 100% that there's got to be a better way, and we're trying to utilize, Forgotten Man's trying to do a better job with, um, you know, uh, social media. Um, so we're trying to utilize Facebook and YouTube with, with live events that are streamed as well, because we can't have large groups at a time. Um, when we had our banquet last year, uh, we had it I think it was like March 8th. So when did the whole state lock down? Like March 14th or 15th or something like that, 
So we got our banquet in like under the wire. And um, we had 300 people there. Um, because it's not just churches. We work with, a, we work with a, a community of folks that are called jail reentry. So in working with the jail reentry community, that's some of the, um, the rehab services, um, uh, some of the housing, transitional housing places, the Salvation Armies, the, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, Families Against Narcotics, some of those, you know, we work with many of those groups trying to position people with someone that ha provides a service that they need as they're coming out to try to gain them success. Jobs, there's other programs called Reconnections that are doing job training, soft skills, those types of things, preparing them for getting a job. And right now, I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but if you're driving around anywhere in Genesee County, just about every business you go by has a hiring sign out, right? So why aren't people going to work? Why is there such a need for people to work? They're getting paid well to stay home, right? So all these companies are struggling to gain workers. Well, folks coming out of a jail or prison have a need for a job, right? You want a ready and willing workforce. I'm not guaranteeing that they're going to be the best employee right off the bat because they may not have that skill set. But in order to gain parole or probation, they probably have to have a job and they have to have an address. What's that? Yeah. And I, I've had a number of companies that have said, exactly, these are some of the best, they show up all the time. Why? Because if they don't, they go back. So there's huge incentive for them to be there. So there's a ready and willing workforce if people or companies can get past the idea that they have a colored past. I don't know about you, but I would be afraid. You know, most of these people that have committed a crime, they've committed a crime and it's, now it's public record, right? So people, if it's a higher profile case that gets dismissed or something and they walk into your church, people are going to go, hey, that's, you know, that's that guy that did that thing, you know. And, um, but, you know, if we all had to wear a placard above our head that said, oh, this is a list of my sins I just didn't get busted for, how many of us would come to church? I probably wouldn't. Just saying. I'd watch from home. <laughs> but go ahead. Kenny, uh, I... Uh ministered in the Genesee County Jail under Chaplain L. Novak mm -hmm. and uh, other other jails and prisons. I've had training with the uh, prison fellowship. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is, what are you doing different? I'm hearing some good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I got dismissed from being able to minister in the jail because I was caring about the men too much. And Chaplain Novak had sort of a Catholic or to him, and I'm hearing some good things about you. Uh, what are you doing different to help the men, especially um, with Chris Swanson? It was uh, uh, Sheriff Pical mm -hmm. that was running Sheriff the jail. And he thought it was a church, him and his wife, rather than a jail. But <laughs> yeah, um, Sheriff Pical, uh, good, good guy, really good guy. Uh, Al, I've known. Uh, uh, you mentioned Al Novak. Al was the chaplain for. I think 33 or 34 years, a long it was time. Nine years, nine years I ministered there. And so um, I was actually the youth director for Al's. Al's got two groups of kids. <laughs> he's got three that are probably about seven or eight years younger than me. And then he's got, a, there was a gap. There was like a second family, a decision later, we'll call him. Um, but uh, um, so I've known Al for a number of years. And uh, Al's, uh, a very godly man. Yes. He's very driven and feels passionate about the inmates. You know, you can't do something for 30 years and, and coast. He worked very, very hard. And so he retired a couple of years ago. And it was, you know, they, they had somebody earmarked to take over for him. And that gentleman had a stroke. Um, and a young guy, you know, like right around 50. I think that's young for a stroke anyway. Um, but he had a stroke and so he was unable to to uh, fulfill the chaplaincy so they brought in an interim uh another gentleman and uh 
they made him, then they made him full time. And then he, they found out that he fell in the jail. And when they did an MRI, they found that he had cancer. And so uh, he's in remission now. That's great. But essentially, the, I tell you all that because the jail was without a chaplain, for, a lead chaplain for two years. So I give the um, assistant chaplains, uh, uh, there was two of them, a male and a female. They uh, did what I call, they kept the chaplaincy together with duct uh, tape and glue and some elbow grease. And they kept it going. And uh, when I came on, there were some things that we needed to change. Uh, as far as curriculum, some of it was dated. Um, not that it was bad, but it was dated. So just taking a little bit of a different approach. Uh, but um, for me, I like to think that me standing in front of somebody and preaching for an hour, I don't think that's super effective. Not at life changes. So what one of the things that I believe God was putting in my little head was is that we have to be relational. What I did, Kenny, is I was having the men actually called it a service, and we were only supposed to call it a Bible study. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had allowed the men to exercise their ability to preach the gospel mm -hmm. to themselves because I knew one thing, that when they went back to the pods and the cells, they're going to be there preaching to one another and teaching one another. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you help someone exercise that, it's not going to happen. You know, I was uh, very blessed with having uh, Pastor Richard Eugene Blue, who since went to be home with the Lord, mm -hmm. and he introduced me. He gave me a drug problem. He dragged me to the jails, the prisons, the streets, and uh, now I'm, I'm very content with preaching the gospel to anyone. Mm -hmm. The other day I was having lunch or something over to uh, Leo's in in Fenton, and I led the uh, the waitress to the Lord, but um, and she was so grateful. She was so grateful. She was hungry. Um, I don't know how many in here are millennials, but some of them have not heard who Jesus Christ is, which is really interesting. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's 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 sad. And also, the ratio in the city of Flint. Do you know how much the ratio is as far as believers to non-believers? I don't, I don't, um, I don't know that ratio. It's about 50%. I would be surprised it was that high. Yeah, but. yeah, it's really sad. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I was told by Chaplain L in uh, Livingston County to come and see you. So, oh. Yeah, he likes you. He likes you. Yeah, here. Cha Alan? Alan? Alan likes me? Yes. Wow. Oh, huh. <laughs> That's one chaplain out of the ones I lead, so. No, Alan's a good guy. Alan's been doing it for 26 years down in Livingston County. And uh, the staff down there loves Alan. And uh, so um, I got to be careful, you know. I don't, don't want Alan to try to get me fired or anything. No, Alan's a good man. And uh, it is encouraging that I would tell you um, that during COVID, we, the, although, so quick backstory, when, the, when they, when the, when the whole state went on lockdown, um, all of the chaplains in Forgotten Man, with the exception of, Myself and my assistant and like a couple other volunteers were all furloughed. They were all asked because all the sheriffs said, we don't want anybody in here. It's, we're on lockdown every day. So all the ministry across the jails all, all stopped in pretty much the entire state, at least our state. I don't know about the others, but it all stopped. But our sheriff said, no, this is important. So we were able to do some of those things. We were able to share and we still weren't able to go into the pods. But if we got the materials through the book carts and stuff like that, we found that a lot of these inmates started these personal Bible studies. And that's so encouraging. You see that. And I can go on the out. I can't go in, but I'm just watching a guy stand up there and preach the whole pod. I can't go in the, in the pod and preach the whole pod because of religious freedom. But an inmate, he can do it. So I'm going to give him as much materials as I can and keep pumping them up. And so, again, we're working on that relational aspect. And I really agree with you that um, the most effective witness are the guys going back into the pods and sharing their faith. We are, share, we are sending missionaries out. This is something God revealed to me. I didn't, you think about this. If you got 80% going back into the communities and it's not just Genesee County, we don't only have um, inmates from Genesee County and Genesee County. It's whoever comes to Genesee County, commits a crime, goes in there, but they go back to their home counties. So I'm looking at Erica because I don't, you guys know John, her husband. 
I just hired John. John is now the lead chaplain at Shiawassee County. And uh, I'm really excited about that. I don't know if Eric is excited about it, but, uh, <laughs> but it's been fun to watch John catch fire. He hadn't done a whole lot of jail ministry. He'd been, I think, on, he, I think he'd went on Thanksgiving one time with us or something. But to see him very quickly gain a passion for these men is exciting. To see that fire grow in somebody really quickly. And especially, you know, somebody that's not um, as old as I am. Uh, some, you know, the, see younger folks coming in there. I think we need to be age diversified as well as ethnically diversified. Dean, did you have a question? Run, Carrie. We only got a couple minutes. They told me to be done by eight. So, go ahead, Dina. Well, I know I'm trying to be good, though. I know that you shared this before, but not tonight. What was the percentage of people that are in jail in Genesee County or in the state of Michigan due to addiction? And then that is probably the return rate was so high because of addiction. Is, am I recalling that? Okay, a couple, yeah. There's a okay. couple statistics that are kind of embedded what your, your question is. Uh, so number one, um, addiction. Uh, I always start the discussion out with addiction with this. This is what I'm about to tell you. Why, the, any, I'm going to ask you a question first. Why do you think addiction is so prevalent? In, our, in, the, in the world, not just our society, but in the world, why do you think addiction is so prevalent? Depression. Hmm? Depression. Depression? Anybody else? Pain. Pain? Like they don't have a purpose. Okay. Need for God. Need for God? Broken families. Broken families? Mm, uh, I don't remember. Oh. Well, this is my personal belief, and, and I don't really have a lot of scripture to stand, back this up. Um, it goes back to the I don't know thing. It's just a personal opinion. Um, I think God creates us with an addictive nature, right? And we're trying to fill it with something else. Many of us, it's different things, you know. It may be alcohol, it may be prescription drugs, it may be pot, it may be pornography, it may be, it may be golf, fishing. Sorry, Tom. Uh, but <laughs> Tom and I have been fishing together. Um, but it, it's, it's something to replace that void that, we've been created with an addiction. But the addiction really is, any addiction that people that will tell you is that it's the initial euphoria that they're chasing. If it's a drug, or if it's an alcohol, or whatever it is, or that fish you caught the first time out, you know, you're chasing that, you're chasing that initial euphoria. And everything, every time after that, it never comes back the same, but you're still chasing it, right? So if that's true, then how is it that we're created with addictive nature and what are we supposed to be addicted to? I believe that we're supposed to be addicted to the euphoria that we have when we come to Christ. That's what we're supposed to be addicted to. And what feeds the addiction? It feeds the addiction when I see things like I did like getting baptized today. Not today, but when you get up, when was that? Monday. Monday. Or somebody coming to Christ or um, the gal that got baptized on Sunday, 17-year-old girl, Natalie Beeman. We know her from the coffee shop. That's a, that was amazing. I didn't know that. Was, but that feeds my addiction. Going into the jail and seeing these guys and say, hey, can you tell me what it's like to have God in your life? Well, that feeds my addiction. But that's another story, that whole discussion. But to answer your question, I think the statistic is 80% are related to drugs in one way, shape, or fashion. But the other thing that feeds into that is the, the mentally... Uh, challenge or disturb people that are either trying to be controlled uh, medically as well. There's no state hospitals in Michigan anymore uh, for those who have mental issues. So they come to the jail. So it complicates many aspects of the jail to where we have to have our own, uh, and Sarah's not in here, she's, uh, we have to have our own 
nursing staff and medical staff to regulate all of the drugs these guys and ladies are on. It's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. So there's a lot of challenges. So you'll see some people that are walking around in a couple of the pods. There was one pod that we call 3A. It's, it's the observational housing unit, the OHU. And these guys typically look like zombies. And it's, and it's super, super sad. And we have a couple chaplains who specialize in going in there. And, uh, you know, who really got a passion very quickly for going in there? It's your husband. That's pretty cool stuff. So, any more questions? Sorry. I love John Stone. <laughs> you can have him. I just want him a couple days a week. I mean, I'm just kidding. I love John. Any other questions? Right there. How did God um, provide for you financially as you went from being a regular working guy into your ministry? Uh, was there any hiccups? Um, were you just totally trustworthy that he was going to provide for you financially and that everything was going to work out? Because that's kind of kind of scary. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. God has been very, very gracious. Um, so last year we decided, uh, because I was spending so much time in the, in the jail ministry and, and I took on the, the regional position, that does involve some traveling. So just so you understand, the, the 11 counties, it was nine counties when I took it over, but God has graciously opened up two more new counties to us. Um, so I got to do it this way, sorry. Um, Midland Bay, Saginaw, Shiawassee, Genesee, Livingston. Then we go across into all of the thumb, Lapeer, uh, St. Clair, and now San Alac, Huron, and Tuscola. So 11 counties. Um, and uh, I would tell you that Forgotten Man is very generous. Uh, I don't deserve it. But uh, God's faithful. He is. But we don't choose to live in that world. I didn't. That's why I kept... You know, you know, it's funny. Uh, I think it's funny. Carrie didn't. Um, uh, so we made the decision to sell the company because we're like saying, if we're going to trust God, we're going to do it 100%, right? Okay. Well, Carrie was working at uh, a local municipality, and uh, after we sold the company, three, day, three days later, she got laid off. Um, so she's been on unemployment, so she's been making more unemployment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> God's good. Uh, so, um, but no, God has been very gracious, uh, more than we deserve. And uh, so we're thankful for that. And I would tell you that Forgotten Man Ministries is very, very, uh, it, it's at the forefront of the executive director's um, mind to take care of the chaplains financially, spiritually, um, to care for them, because I would tell you, that there's a scary, another scary uh, statistic that's out there, and I struggle, struggle with the word statistic, I'm sorry, um, but that in ministry across our country, 1,500 ministers or pastors are stepping away from the ministry, from full-time ministry, a month. A month. And why is that? We just hired one for Lapeer County, and St. Clair County for the exact reason I think it's predominant. He was stepping away before we even offered him a position because his statement was he's tired of trying to pull, tired of pulling Christians' butts out of the seats. That's sad. It goes back to the axiom that uh, 80%, it used to be 80% or 20% of the church is doing 80% of the work in giving. I don't think that number's true anymore. I think it's more 1090. So. Yeah, that's why they call them cues, because you sit there and think. <laughs> <laughs> you got one, one quick follow-up, then I want to finish with something real quick, and then. This is just my observation. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a very basic Bible church. Mm -hmm. I was a Christian. But God never told, I, I was never introduced to what they call a spirit-filled life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that was. I mean, I had the Holy Spirit living inside me, but I had not a clue what that meant. You know, it's different than just having de devotions, but to be introduced to the Holy Spirit, a live person who lives inside you, and how you activate that power, I wasn't told how. I was told that certain things didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, 
God, when I was about in my 30s, began to change, and I got introduced to the Holy Spirit. Mm. So I would say that was part of the problem because a lot of people, God's not exciting to them. It's not real. They go to church. They're Christians, but they, they're not yeah. They're not filled with the power of God. God is dead to them. That's just my observation. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's probably spot on in many instances. You know, it's, I think that um, we, I don't know that we necessarily in all cases are quenching the Holy Spirit. You see that in the Bible. But it's not a life that is submitted to his leading. The Holy Spirit should be convicting us of sin. That should be uh, influencing our decisions. I like to call the Holy Spirit the great influencer, right? Um, he can influence me to choose the right path. It gives, it gives us a, the ability, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to make a perfect choice. You just don't pick it, right? So a uh, couple things real quick in closing. Uh, one, I appreciate you guys sitting here and acting like you're paying attention. Um, and number two, um, how many have heard or seen on the announcement board the power of three? Have you guys seen that? Has anybody explained what that is or how that came about? So you guys all understand where that came from, and it came from an inmate? Okay. Um, that guy's name is Daniel Painter, and I had uh, the opportunity to pray with Daniel uh, being a part of the prison ministry, and him giving his probably 30 or 40% of what he makes is amazing to me. And, and I don't know if, if, the, who, if it was Josh that shared it or whoever shared it, but when, when we did that Power of Three a couple years ago, across all the locations, I think we raised over $100,000 for projects at the churches and stuff. And I went and told that to Daniel, our next trip down there, and he just broke down and wept. He goes, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. I said, no, but it was God in you, working through you, speaking to our church. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew the story of that. And uh, uh, if, if you guys feel called and you want to be a part of what we do at the jail, um, i trying to think of the best way, probably uh, see me afterwards and I can give you a, a card and it's got my cell number and we can connect you. Oh, you know what? Uh, actually talk with uh, John Rigg. John Rigg has worked, he works with Pastor Chuck, who's the REACH pastor, and um, they've, they've connected uh, a couple, Nelson and Kelly Rosario, who go to the Grand Lake location, um, to be the jail ministry coordinators. And so we have opportunities to come in and serve, but then also we have opportunities outside of the jail, like I mentioned. We have something that's called the ARM program, and, and the short version of that is you can actually literally email an inmate and it comes to our office, we take it, we deliver it to them, it's called the ARM ministry, Authentic Remote Ministry. And we take them, uh, the, it, that inmate that you're paired with as a specific inmate, we give them the letter with a blank piece of paper because they can't have tons of blank paper, like one or two sheets. And so we give them one that has the ARM logo on the top of it and they respond on that piece of paper and you can take them through, um, you can take them through a Bible study, you can just give them notes of encouragement, and when they respond on that letter, they give it back to us. We scan it with an app on our phone called Genius Scan, and we email it back to you. That's a pretty cool way to be an impact in somebody's life, and not if you don't feel comfortable going to the jail. And uh, it's not just limited to Genesee County. So we could, if we, ha we have over it at any one point in time, probably 8,000 people incarcerated within Forgotten Man Ministries jails. So there's somebody you could connect with and somebody you could bless if you choose to. Not everybody's called to do that, so I'm not trying to guilt you into anything, but there are people out there that could use a note of encouragement and that could use someone who just wants to say that, hey, I believe in you, God has purpose for you, and you're not forgotten, I'm praying for you, whatever. It doesn't have to be, you know, we can give you curriculum if you want to go through a Bible study with them. You know, we've got those things, but it just takes a heart and a desire to step outside maybe your comfort zone and... Uh, do something that could change somebody's life for eternity. I mean, somebody did that for you guys, right? And we're supposed to be willing to do that. And, and I wasn't always really good at that. But um, that two-year period that I went through, I, at the end of it, I started praying. I said, Lord, I thought I was supposed to be a youth, a youth pastor. And I guess that's not the case. What do you got for me? And Josh shared something with me. He said, Kenny, you don't have to be a pastoral, uh, pastor to use pastoral gifts. And... Uh, I guess that's what I get to do. So 
Thanks, everybody, for being here. Let's close in a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get going, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the way you work in our lives, the way that you uh, have given us your Holy Spirit, Lord. Um, Lord, help us to be uh, a fervent user of that power that indwells inside of us. Help us to submit to that leadership, and Lord, just look to focus on the directions you'd have us to go with our lives, the people that we would have opportunity to speak with. Just help us to be relational and show how much you love us. We don't have to have all the doctrine in the world. We just have to know that uh, you changed our lives, and we can just share that, and you can do the rest. Lord, just help us to be faithful. Lord, bless each and every one here. Bless Josh on his birthday. Lord, thank you so much for him. I ask you to strengthen him and, and, and Jen and the family, Lord, as a time together. And just uh, we give this whole night to you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.